I think all the markets in the region are attractive in different ways. So perhaps I can go through them one by one. So in terms of Vietnam, um, I think it's the most attractive in terms of the macro. So looking at the installed capacity now, it's around I think, 80 gigawatts. And looking at the 2030 target in the draft PDPA, it's anywhere between 130 gigawatts in the base case to about 144 gigawatts in what they call the high case. Um, you know, historically, the power sector has grown at 10% year on year, GDP 6 or 7% year on year. So from a pure macro perspective, I think Vietnam is very attractive. And we as GIG are voting with our feet. So we have um, between GIG and our subsidiary company, Blue Leaf Energy, six staff on the ground in Vietnam now. Uh, and we're pushing for our own, you know, large gigawatt scale offshore wind projects. And we're looking at a pipeline of gigawatts of m and opportunities as well across both solar and, and um, wind, both sort of near shore, onshore. So Vietnam is attractive from the macro perspective. Um, if you look at the, the rest of the region in Taiwan and Korea, you know, OECD countries, in those markets, the, um, I think the attraction is that they have specific mechanisms to support offshore wind and specific offshore wind targets. So in the Korea market, you have you know, um, a very well-defined uh, program to, to develop sites to then bilaterally negotiate DPAs. And in Taiwan, you know, they will go into auction next year after already um, committing to you know, more than six gigawatts previously. So the maturity of those markets is what makes it interesting. And then in the Philippines, I think what's interesting, and maybe I'll put Australia into that bucket as well, stretching the definition of APAC a little bit. Um, they are interesting and attractive because they have a fully deregulated energy market. So the kinds of deals you can do there are more, I think, um, corporate PPA driven or, you know, PPA um, competitive processes or, you know, merchant market even. So I think each market is attractive in a different way. Clearly, you know, Vietnam is a big topic. So, and, and that's why I'm country head for Vietnam. And in each of these countries, we've got a big team um, pursuing the, the opportunities there. Let me try and answer this question, Molly, in, in maybe two or three different parts. So, so first of all, you know, what is our interpretation of the status of the market as a whole? So I think um, clearly um, to echo um, the comments of um, colleagues earlier, so PDP-8 has not yet been adopted into law, right? Um, so I think it was uh, Gu Yung who made the comment that um, the net zero commitments, uh, you know, are not consistent with the previous draft that we've seen. So there is clearly some... I guess, market friction whilst the policy still lands. However, if you take a step back, you know, we, we are really at an inflection point in the market in terms of levelized cost of energy, LCRE. You know, for the first time in, in a lot of the APEC markets um, and including Vietnam in particular, the LCRE of onshore, and I would even say nearshore and offshore wind is, um, you know, at a very similar level, perhaps already lower than new build thermal projects, whether it's LNG to power or even new coal. And, and of course, I agree with you Gun, that um, coal can't even be built because no, nobody else wants to finance it. So it's a real inflection point in terms of the competitiveness of renewables versus um, thermal. Um, it's also at an inflection point in terms of institutional capital looking to deploy. So I think the numbers I've seen globally is anywhere between $1 trillion to you know, $10 trillion a year of investments into you know, either narrowly defined energy to broadly defined infrastructure required for us to hit net zero. So just a huge, we, we as Macquarie, of course, we're one of the largest sort of funds managers around. So we can already see that the, the appetite of um, institutional capital is really now, you know, everybody's looking to deploy into green. Um, and so, so that's the first point. There's a lot of sort of turbulence, but also interesting inflection points. Um, what does the future hold? I think the future for both Vietnam and more, more broadly APAC is moving away from what we call vanilla easy deals. So um, feed-in tariff, just make sure you build something and then there's a feed-in tariff. It's moving away from that towards what I call more creative structures. So even in Vietnam, I think it was mentioned earlier, there's a DPPA program, which hopefully is put into law next year. We've been waiting for that for a couple of years now. Um, DPPA is equivalent to kind of a corporate PPA in the more deregulated markets like Taiwan and the Philippines. Obviously in Taiwan and the Philippines, they, they, you can already do um, corporate PPAs. You know, what else? Batteries, perhaps to try and load shift throughout the day. Um, so I think the, the future direction is moving towards more complicated, more creative uh, financial um, uh, structures. 
And then in terms of GID's business plan, which is my third point, you know, how do we see the future? We are committed to the medium to long term. So, you know, we, we recognize that, especially mm -hmm. somewhere like Vietnam, where you're waiting for PDP-8 to be able to make an investment decision, final investment decision this year or next year might be challenging, but we set our sights, you know, on a five or five plus year horizon. And we certainly see on that horizon, looking for projects that reach, you know, uh, NTP notice to proceed middle of this decade and COD towards the end of this decade, there's a huge opportunity. And, um, and so we're, we're committed to that. Um, it would be hard to give one answer that um, is, is applicable to everyone. So I, what I would say is um, if, you, if you wind the clock back a few years, uh, investing in a, uh, a project in APAC in the greenfield stage, especially early development. So by that, I mean, maybe site survey license, uh, maybe, you know, not yet in the PDP or applying for. Previously, we've seen that to be uh, more people like ourselves, so GIG or some of the developers on this call uh, and the institutional uh, capital in terms of pension funds and insurance companies, you know, they've tended to stay away from that. Um, I think what we've seen is COP26 and, and a real wake up call of the world needing to hit net zero. We see a lot more of the institutional uh, capital wishing to come in early, actually. So, you know, they, I, I think, um, so, so, so I think going forward, that institutional capital is likely to go up the risk curve. The challenges, I think the biggest challenge, well, clearly there's, there's investment risk um, associated with investing in something early stage. You know, so you can spend money on DevEx and perhaps your project uh, never make, never comes to fruition. Maybe you, you never get that permit or perhaps. Um, so I think that's that's one key risk. Um, I would say more than that, it's just time. So um, if you really want to deploy a large amount of capital um, quickly uh, to generate cash flows, you'll be buying portfolios of operating assets. Um, but if you do have a medium to long-term view that you can wait three to five years before you, you develop, deploy that capital, then you should get in early at the development stage. And that's your, um, I guess, the risk is what we just talked about. Um, I think especially in APAC, there is um, policy, what I would call risk. So one year, very supportive. Next year, all of a sudden, um, put the brakes on. So kind of a feast or famine. Um, so I think that's a risk that... Um, but otherwise, I think, um, you know, we certainly are looking to go up the risk curve and we see everybody else following us up the risk. Question is, um, you think that it might be not possible or, or difficult to find this level of capital to invest into Vietnam, right? I think that's an implicit part of your question. So how would I answer yeah. that? I, I would say, first of all, there is probably excess demand of what they're struggling with, so the constraint of supply, uh, properly structured deals uh, that will tick the boxes of the investment committees or of the likes of, of you know, the, the big um, passive funds. Um, so it's not necessarily an aversion to the country risk, um, although you know, being familiar with Vietnam will, will help. And it's not even necessarily an aversion to some of these big issues that we often talk about. So, you know, every wind conference I've, I've attended, people talk about, you know, the PPA risk, the curtailment, um, you know, change in law arbitration, all of these things. But I do think that if you look across the region at some of the precedents, um, some other markets, you know, people were saying similar things about the Taiwan market not so long ago, but eventually the investors and the lenders actually just all got comfortable with it and, and invested. And in my view, it's because they recognize that the theoretical risk, you know, that was outweighed by the opportunity of the clearly defined pipeline to, to uh, deploy billions of dollars. And so um, I'm getting to my answer winded. I guess what I'm saying is if we can structure projects appropriately, then the capital will come. And then now you say, well, what, what does structuring projects appropriately mean? I think PA is eventually put into law. And whether it's the feed-in time regime or DPPBA, as long as there's certainty, we can then move forward. Um, and then as long as developers so like ourselves, um, other international developers, or even the locals are allowed to just get on with it and structure projects within the parameters given, whether it's a DP. Um, and as long as we can structure it in an investable way, then the capital will come. So I don't really see, um, I don't think the challenge is, is lack of people wanting to deploy. I actually think the challenge is there's more money then there are projects right now to invest in.